I'm Philip Booth, Academic and Research Director at the Institute of Economic Affairs, and I'm going to talk to Bill Easterly, who's a Professor of Economics at New York University, about the role of international institutions in economic development. Bill, you're a big critic of rich countries intervening from outside to try to promote development in poor countries. What are the problems with rich countries doing this? Why doesn't it work? Well, the fundamental problem, the fundamental, fundamental reason it doesn't work is there's a real lack of any kind of accountability to the poor people that we're trying to help. If you just contrast the situation with those of us who are lucky enough to live in free societies, we can hold the private or public suppliers of all of our needs accountable to us. So if we don't like a, a private firm's product, we can drive them out of business by not buying it. If we don't like what our government is giving us, we can vote them out of power, we can mount political protests. So we can hold our private and public suppliers accountable to us as free citizens. Unfortunately, the world's poor are not free citizens relative to the world's official aid agencies. They have no way of holding them accountable. The world's aid agencies can and do uh, wasteful and foolish projects that totally miss the point of poor people's problems and never suffer the consequences because poor people are not spending their own money, they have no means of protesting. Even on the rare occasions they, they do mount a, a protest, it never gets covered, never, no one is ever held accountable for that protest. And so poor people are just voiceless and helpless in, at the mercy of official aid agencies who frankly don't know enough what to do about their problems anyway. Okay, and you worked for 16 years at the World Bank. Uh, what yes, does that teach yes. you about the importance of those kinds of international institutions in promoting development? Uh, well, I was in the research department of the World Bank, and there's a lot of there were a lot of good things going on there. The World Bank was able to attract some very good economists and preach some very good ideas about economics of, of development for a long time. But it, the World Bank suffers, as all the other aid agencies do, from the lack of accountability to the poor. And it suffers a lot, as other international organizations do, from political constraints, which cause censorship, which is obviously not good for the free exchange of ideas and deciding what works. So any idea that was deemed critical of the World Bank was automatically censored. And so the World Bank could never learn from its own mistakes because it could never even admit that it had made any mistakes, and no one else was allowed to point out that it had made any mistakes. So there was no sort of culture of organizational learning that, that is required to, in order to correct mistakes. And is there any way these sorts of institutions can be reformed to make them more useful, more helpful, or by their nature are they in effect doomed to failure? Well, I, I don't like to use the word doomed to failure, but we do have to recognize there are very serious political constraints on these international organizations. The World Bank is, is, has a very large place for the U.S. and U.K. and other European shareholders to determine its policies, and they often determine its policies in a way that's, uh, that's going to be you know, helpful to their own foreign policy interests. So, for example, the World Bank will give a lot of, of aid to U.S. allies like Ethiopia and Uganda that are both run by tyrannical regimes that happen to be U.S. and U.K. allies in the war on terror. And so those political constraints are going to always hamper any reform efforts that you try to make to try to make the World Bank or other, organ like the U.N., other international organizations run better. So if it's difficult to promote development from outside, then I suppose one is uh, hoping that there will be internal reform within poor countries themselves which will promote development. What kind of policies is it best for them to uh, adopt in order to promote economic development? Well, I, I'm glad you asked that. I don't want to leave a message of sort of gloom and doom, nothing is working in development. The, the good news is that these homegrown economic reform efforts and political reform efforts are actually underway in developing countries have been underway for a long time. There's been a movement towards more political and economic freedom in poor countries, which just means the real basics like respecting property rights, allowing markets to function, allowing international trade to function so that countries can specialize in what they're best at, uh, allowing you know, entrepreneurs to, re to keep the, the, the rewards of their own entrepreneurship. Those, basic elements have gotten increasingly recognized by poor country policymakers over time. And as a result, we do see a lot of positive trends in the developing world. We see declining poverty, rising life expectancy, falling infant mortality, 
uh, just overall economic growth in every region of the world, including Africa, the one that is usually seen as a basket case, has actually been more like a case of growing freedom and economic growth. And perhaps could you give us an example? Um, tell us about an example of one country, perhaps not China, because everybody talks about China, yeah. um, where you've had um, homegrown policy change without, with very little um, assistance and foreign aid from outside, uh, which has promoted um, developments and all the sorts of improvements uh, you talk about in incomes, life expectation, and so on? Well, one good example in Africa is Ghana. Uh, Ghana had really terrible economic policies after independence in 1957, in which, which really effectively destroyed the leading export indus industries like cocoa in Ghana, was totally destroyed by government policies like uh, severely controlled exchange rates that meant the cocoa producers were getting a really terrible price compared to the world price. And so that had so much destroyed the economy by around the mid-1980s that uh, the Ghanaian leader at the time, Jerry Rawlings, who's you know, far from a good guy in other respects, but at least in one respect he realized that the economy had hit rock bottom and he really had to do something. So he started liberalizing the economy, letting cocoa producers get the world price instead of, you know, one sixteenth of the world price. Mm -hmm. Cocoa recovered, lots of other uh, sectors recovered. And then Ghanaians also started demonstrating for their political rights, which is another important ingredient for, for development. And so Ghana has since then become also a democracy that has now held five successive peaceful, competitive democratic elections and has had very healthy economic growth ever since that turnaround in economic policy in the mid-1980s. So, you know, there's still a lot of poverty left in Ghana, but it's been very much on an upward trajectory since the 1980s because of that kind of homegrown reform. Now, the World Bank did, to be fair, did, both the World Bank and the IMF did offer support after the reforms were initiated in Ghana, and that's probably something that constructively can be done by outside agencies that is just supporting homegrown actors when they themselves decide to reform on their own. Thank you very much. Sure, my pleasure. Okay.